Welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight's topic is leptospirosis, how to protect your horse, and is brought to you tonight by our sponsor, Zoetis. Leptospirosis is a, is a bacterial disease associated with abortion of mares and certain types of equine recurrent uvi uveitis, and which is the most common cause of blindness in horses. Our experts tonight are Dr. Craig Carter with the University of Kentucky and Dr. Jackie Boggs, who's with Zoetis. Welcome, doctors. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> Hi. Happy to be here. Um, let's go ahead and start with you, Dr. Carter. I know you have a lot of experience with lepto. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience is? Yes, uh, it's it's really been one of the highlights of my career, I guess you might say. I, it's a very interesting organism. I've been a vet now for over 35 years, and you know, back in Texas when I was in practice, I I uh, I diagnosed lepto in dogs and cattle and horses pretty routinely. Uh, blindness in horses from lepto was always uh, the most heartbreaking thing you can remember for the owners and and for myself. Um, after leaving practice. I joined the veterinary diagnostic lab at Texas A&M began monitoring uh, zoonotic diseases that were being diagnosed there, especially in the dog at the time there because there were so many cases. Uh, I recall a, a couple on their new, new two children adopted two puppies from the animal shelter uh, in Dallas and both pups died submitted to our lab for an autopsy. It's what we vets call a necropsy and the uh, diagnosis was lepto, and I called the submitting vet and asked him to follow up with the family. Turned out that mom had been ill, and uh, so the short story was she went back to her physician, and she was diagnosed with lepto, and likely from the pups. Uh, thankfully, she fully recovered. So I was thinking, wow, it could have been the kids too. Uh, I spent a lot of time overseas and studied leptospirosis in Iraq and the Caribbean basin, where many people become infected and. Uh, lepto is actually the most widespread zoonotic disease in humans. I think they estimate anywhere from half a million to a million cases a year around the globe. So it's it's what you'd maybe I call my pet disease and a very interesting one. And uh, after coming to Kentucky, I learned that leptospirosis was such a major cause of abortion and blindness here. And uh, so there was no licensed vaccine for the horse at the time. And so I, I and our colleagues here began conducting uh, studies to help build a case, you know, for a vaccine so that it could be prevented. Okay. And Dr. Boggs, uh, you're with Zoetis that does have a vaccine now for horses. Can you tell us about how you've been involved uh, with the disease? Sure. So in addition to uh, being a doctor of veterinary medicine, I'm also board certified in internal medicine, which means I have additional experience and training in infectious diseases such as leptospirosis, so a particular interest and area of mine. Um, where it really hit home is when I was in practice um, and on faculty at a veterinary school in the South East, where I consulted with farms and veterinarians who were dealing with clinical cases of leptospirosis and really some of the challenges they faced in terms of treatment or lack of good treatments and, um, and, and prevention and lack of good prevention before there was a vaccine. So um, as Dr. Carter said, you know, I too have firsthand experienced some of those heartbreaking cases. Um, I subsequently joined Zoetis five years ago as a technical service veterinarian, and one of my assignments was to work closely with our research and development and our marketing departments as the technical expert on the disease of leptospirosis. Um, in addition, I helped facilitate last year the launch of the first and only leptospirosis vaccine for horses as you mentioned, Michelle, called Lepto EQ Innovator. And so it really is a passion of mine as well, and I'm pleased to be here tonight. Okay. Well, welcome to both of you. Uh, I want to remind our audience about how our Ask the Horse Lives work, a uh, quick review of our format. Uh, we'll start by asking the questions that were submitted during registration. Uh, however, if you're listening live, you can submit questions to us live, especially those follow-up questions are great. Uh, if you need clarification or want to better understand uh, the doctor's answers, uh, you can enter those in the chat window in front of you if, you're, um, if you've joined us via your computer. We're going to do the uh, our best to get to as many of your questions as possible, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, now, Dr. Carter, can you explain to us what leptospirosis is for those who aren't familiar with it? 
Well, it's it's a, it's a disease uh, caused by uh, uh, an organism, Leptospira enterogens, and there's several uh, several uh, serovars to this. And uh, it's a gram-negative organism. It's modal. It it uh, kind of moves across the microscope when you're watching it. Um, it's a tightly coiled spiral single cell organism with a little hook on the end. It's kind of a pretty little pretty little guy. Uh, it's very hard to culture in the lab, so we use other methods to to diagnose it. It does like moist, temperate environments, and uh, you know, of course, it's 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 uh, shed wildlife sheds this thing into the environment, and of course, infected animals can domestic animals can do the same. Uh, it's generally the portal of entry is through mucous membranes or abraded skin. It, it, it goes from there to lymphatics in the bloodstream with a bacteremia in about four to ten days and ends up in the liver, kidney, muscles, eyes, and even in the brain and, of course, the genital tract. Uh, the portal of exit is urine. So, again, that's where, where we get this thing that completes the cycle, gets back into the environment. Um, and we have a question, Dr. Carter, from Randy in Kentucky. And Randy wants to know, how does the same bacteria cause both uh, uveitis and pregnancy loss? These seem like two very different things to happen to a horse. That's a great question and a great, great observation. And essentially, you know, the lesions that cause abortion and, and uveitis are both related. They're both vascular lesions. What I mean by that is the the uh, the exotoxin that's eluded by the leptospira organism actually uh, damages the vascular uh, infrastructure and causes hemorrhage and uh, this the toxin you know, that causes necrosis or death and the, and the calcification in the placental tissues uh, upsetting the blood supply to the foal and thereby abortion the uh, uveitis problem usually incurs in, in horses four years or so of age or older and as as was stated in the introduction, the most common cause of blindness in the horse, and this this disease was described by the Greek veterinarian Aspertus, you know, way back in the fourth century. So it's been around a while. Um, in the eye, lithospirus cause damage to multiple tissues, which can lead to things like cataracts and ultimately blindness. So and infections usually begin in only one eye, but ultimately, generally, will will infect both eyes and uh, of course, even leptospirosis can sometimes cause acute kidney failure in the horse. So it's, it's a it's a uh, multi-organ system, uh, multi-systemic kind of a disease. Okay. And Dr. Carter, I'm curious, uh, how is the abortion caused uh, by lepto distinguished from other causes of abortion in horses, like herpes virus? Well, uh, you know, generally it's 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 not very easy to to do differential diagnosis of abortion in you know grossly you know by the veterinarian. So, so as a laboratory veterinarian, uh, we that's one of the jobs. That's where we we really get busy when we start having abortions because we we have to uh, uh, we have to differentiate you know the cause and and of course we uh, to rule out. Or rule in leptospirosis. We we have a polymerase chain reaction that we can run on samples, uh, you know, from the uh, the kidney of the uh, of the foal or from the uh, from the placenta and other other organs. Uh, and we also take heart blood and and run uh, microscopic agglutination titers on the on the foal itself. But generally, that either that or a fluorescent antibody test. Uh, on the same tissues, and uh, they're very, very confirmatory. You know, if, if we have a clinical case of lepto, and we have a nice, fresh, uh, aborted uh, foal, then it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. Dr. Boggs, we have a question from Ari in Spokane, and Dr. Carter has already mentioned that wildlife sheds the bacteria, but Ari wants to know um, where does the bacteria that causes moon blindness come from, and is there a vector? So it's it's this wildlife, but do we have uh, specific animals that, that can transfer it to our horses? Yeah, so there, there are several maintenance animal hosts uh, that, that uh, can harbor the organism in their kidneys, and excrete it into the urine. And the primary ones are skunks and white-tailed deer, uh, raccoons and opossums, uh, and a variety of other 
wildlife. And we also know, as Dr. Carter mentioned earlier, that some domestic animals also uh, are capable of shedding in the urine. And so we know cattle, swine, um, dogs, rodents as well. And so the primary source of infection um, is from this uh, infected urine that's shed into the environment. The organism is really likes a, a warm, moist environment, so it thrives in that area. And then as Dr. Carter mentioned before, horses are exposed by um, contact with primarily this water source, um, but can also be, um, you know, contaminated bedding, feed, drinking water, and also uh, abortive tissues uh, from an aborted fetus are uh, an important source of uh, leptospires. And so then the, the horse mucous membranes are exposed uh, either through the eyes or the mouth or, or, or wounds on the legs, and then it gets into the bloodstream and um, ends up having sort of a propensity for some of those sites that Dr. Carter mentioned, the kidneys, eyes, and reproductive tract. So, Dr. Boggs, I live in an area where cattle often share pastures with horses. Is that a, a much greater risk for horses? Is that a, a time when I should be concerned about my horse contracting lepto? So certainly when there's commingling of uh, horses with cattle, there is an increased risk. Um, cattle shed a variety of different serovars uh, in, their, in their urine, and we know that uh, Pomona is the one that's most commonly associated uh, with disease in the horse, but we know that there are other serovars that uh, cattle can shed that also can cause disease in horses. So yes, that does put your horse at an increased risk potentially. Dr. Carter, our next question is from Melanie in Pennsylvania, and she wants to know about the zoonotic potential of the disease. You mentioned already the story of, of the puppies and the children and the mother that had uh, lepto. Is interspecies transmission between pets and people and horses common? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a multi-species disease, which is, is quite easily transmitted between uh, these different species, uh, and uh, part of that is because there's really no vector, there's not a biological vector, no transformation has to occur, it's just pretty much uh, direct contact and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the organism can get through abraded skin, it can get through mucous membranes, so it's quite easy. But it, uh, as I also mentioned, you know, there's an estimated uh, 1 million cases a year in the world, and it's really considered the most widespread zoonotic disease in the world. And it's it's found in many domestic animals, such as dogs, horses, cattle, swine. Um, it's also prevalent in wildlife, uh, such as uh, raccoons, possums, deer. Uh, many rodents and even sea lions. <laughs> um, although she, uh, Melanie asked about the cat, uh, it's interesting. Uh, although cats can become infected uh, with lep leptospira, they they seldom seem to develop signs of disease and and are thought to be pretty resistant to the to the agent. Dr. Carter, we have a follow-up from Maria, who's in our live audience, and she's wondering about those mice that could possibly have lepto um, and could shed it. Is it is that a concern around our barns if we have mice? And I know we all, any of us who have horses at home, uh, struggle with mice unless we have a really good mouse or cat. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so should should we be taking extra precautions to uh, to get those mice uh, out yes, of our barns? Uh, Yes, every everything should be done to really try to minimize the contact with any kind of a wildlife or rodents because um, you know they are just very likely to be uh, carrying the organism and 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 shedding it into the environment. I think this is one of the reasons we were kind of surprised when we when, when we found on our national studies uh, that we had actually you know seen uh, horses that are at high exposure to lepto in very dry states, you know, like New Mexico and Nevada, but but those states also have very high rodent, you know, populations, and uh, with with them shedding and as with the numbers that you you can have, uh, it 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 really does increase the you know the risk of contamination and and exposure. So although it's not easy, you know, to control wildlife in and around a, a horse operation, it's just something you have to you know, try to do. Yeah. yeah, I've been fighting pack rats all summer, so, <laughs> but I'll keep on it, get get those guys out of my, my hay shed. Um, 
<laughs> Dr. Boggs, the, the pack rat needs to go for many reasons, including a chewed on saddle, but we won't get into that. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Boggs, Lori in Mississippi owns an Appaloosa, and she wants to know how she would know if her Appaloosa has lepto. But before you get to that part of her question, can you explain uh, to us why someone who owns an Appaloosa might be more concerned about lepto than, than say, other horse owners? <clears throat> Sure. So, um, as we've mentioned, the, the three primary clinical entities that we see in the horse uh, when we recognize uh, lepto in the horse it, um, include abortion, uh, uveitis, which is inflammation of the eye, and uh, renal disease. And so, why are Appaloosas um, extra high on our radar? Because we know that they are at actually an increased risk of developing lepto-associated uveitis. So um, uveitis, uh, and especially equine recurrent uveitis, or maybe some of you might be familiar with the term moon blindness, is a collection of um, ocular diseases or inflammation in the eye. And so there are many things that can trigger it. Uh, but what we know is that uh, lepto is by far and away the number one trigger, and it accounts for about up to about 70% of the cases. But it's a multifactorial disease. So what we mean by that is um, that there is, you, you need to be exposed to a triggering agent or organism, a bacteria or a virus or something like that, so lepto potentially. We also know that there's a genetic component to this, so a genetic predisposition. And what we know from the literature is that those Appaloosas are overrepresented in terms of um, the, the general horse population that get uveitis that's triggered by leptospirosis. And so, so they have some genetic um, components that predispose them to be at increased risk. We also know that warm bloods and draft horses are also uh, predisposed uh, for that genetic component. And then the third piece of that equine recurrent uveitis or, or moon blindness is um, an immune-mediated component. So it's a very complicated disease, so it doesn't mean that every Appaloosa is going to be at risk of um, getting uveitis or um, every Appaloosa that's ex even exposed to leptospira organisms would be, but we know that as a, as a general breed, they are at increased risk compared to some of the other breeds. And we also know that, unfortunately, um, that they are at greater risk of going blind, and they are at greater risk of going blind in not only one eye, but two eyes, um, from some work by uh, Dr. Ann Dwyer out of uh, New York. And so um, that's why they're at extra increased risk. And Dr. Boggs, so I, I've owned Appaloosas and I worked for the Appaloosa Horse Club. I really, I have a soft spot for, for the breed and, and mm -hmm. one thing that really breaks my heart is when uh, I'll go to the horse sales and there's, it seems like there's always an Appaloosa with moon blindness going through the sales uh, that someone mm -hmm. has, yeah. that they're, they're being auctioned off and it just, it really, it, it makes me very, very sad to see that. So how can Appaloosa owners protect their horses so they don't end up in that situation where they are blind and there's a, maybe a future owner that can't manage that issue. Sure. So that's, um, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges that both Dr. Carter and I have seen, you know, in practice, um, you know, in, in our past is that um, prevention is one of the biggest challenges here. You know, we talked about the wildlife, you know, we, we kidded and said that every barn has exposure to rats. Well, if you look at the list of things that are, are potential risk factors for leptospirosis exposure, probably just about every horse across the country could be, you know, have one or more of these risk factors. And so, um, you know, it's really a challenge for the horse owners to, how do you eliminate cattle grazing with your horse if that's where you, you know, your horse, how do you eliminate the wildlife or how do you control the rats and when we can try or the, or the mice, uh, but it's a challenge. So first and foremost, that would be the, the first thing to focus on. Um, and, you know, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the vaccine at some point potentially, but, um, you know, that might be a place where Appaloosas are really, if they're at greater risk, it, it might be worth talking to your veterinarian about, you know, adding the vaccine into your protocol. Um, but you certainly want to be careful, um, you know, and, and look at these horses and make sure they're not already um, suffering from uveitis before doing that. So, Dr. Carter, we have a question from Dale in Illinois, and he wants to know what clinical uh, signs an owner might detect in their horse uh, before the horse gets uveitis. 
Well, that's another great question. You know, lepto lepto often presents uh, initially as you know what what we used to call in the old days the ADR, the ain't doing right animal. You know, with fever, lethargy, anorexia, sort of those sort of nondescript uh, signs going off feed, just not looking right, a little rough. Um, and of course, you know, lepto should always be ruled out after after an abortion in a horse, and if it's confirmed, then um, treatment with antibiotics can be considered a, a, a good chance of, of clearing the the infection from the horse. I mean, you know, uh, some horses will will be shedding shedders for up to 60 days. I don't think there's any scientific data that can conclusively tell you, you know, how long a, a horse harbors lepto organisms. Uh, uh, but the main thing is, you know, when I and I may became might become involved at a later date after an abortion or even without an abortion, and obviously in a male animal, a gilding or a stallion, that wouldn't be the case. And uh, so, uh, basically, it's it's pretty difficult um, if if there's not another event or or not uh, a veterinarian has not actually diagnosed your horse with either a renal problem related to lepto or, a, or an abortion, the uh, the uh, exposure that results ultimately maybe years later in uveitis may go go undetected. Uh, the the only other thing that uh, what happens here in, in the bluegrass uh, horse country uh, with the number of animals that we have and uh, the many of the farms are monitoring the titers, the antibody titers uh, to lepto throughout the entire reproductive season, and this uh, this actually works quite nicely because we can read those titers and 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 decide uh, you know how uh, pretty much where whether this is just a, a past exposure or whether it's a active infection uh, in the horse. So that's another way uh, that you could try to detect an infection uh, early on. Dr. Boggs, Michelle in Colorado wants to know what are the treatment options for a horse that has lepto? Great question. So uh, it depends on what um, clinical entity we're talking about here. If we're talking about renal disease, um, certainly there are some antibiotic options and some horses are, are able to recover from that. Um, sometimes we do lose the horses that uh, get acute renal uh, infection from leptospirosis, sources, unfortunately, but antibiotics would be a mainstay, as well as there's an impairment of the kidney function often, and so those horses might be quite sick and they might require some additional um, IV fluids uh, to help recover the, uh, the functioning of the kidneys if those horses are able to recover. Uh, when it comes to abortion, well, there's not really a, a treatment per se for abortion. Um, you know, Dr. Carter mentioned that, that some of the farms in, in central Kentucky are prophylactically treating with antibiotics, but we don't really have, at this point, we have anecdotal kind of data. I don't know we have good, um, solid scientific data to, yet to support that, but we're gathering more information around that. And then um, when it comes to equine recurrent uveitis, um, if, it's, if it's an acute, if it's a equine recurrent uveitis is specifically a syndrome where the horse has repeated bouts of inflammation in the eye, hence the name recurrence is in there. And so in those cases, um, we aren't able to really cure them. We're able to symptomatically respond to the clinical signs that we're seeing. So this is a very painful condition. Um, and the eye becomes very contracted. The pupil becomes very contracted and that in and of itself can be painful. And so the mainstay of therapy when the horse is having what we call an acute flare is to add um, something called atropine, which will dilate the eye and um, the pupil and help calm down some of that pain. A veterinarian may also add in something uh, to manage pain, like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, but really the cornerstone for the treatment uh, for this is steroids, because as I mentioned before, there is this immune-mediated component so uh, what's happening is the immune system is inappropriately responding. Um, there are proteins in the eyes that uh, look similar to the immune system to proteins in the leptospires. And so the immune system is thinking it's doing a good job and it's trying to clear, um, you know, 
what it thinks is the organism and clear this, but it's inappropriately responding. So it would be something like rheumatoid arthritis or any other types of immune-mediated types of diseases that we know about. Steroids are really the mainstay there. Um, but again, you know, none of these are, are really necessarily good treatment options. Um, we certainly aren't curing equine recurrent uveitis. Um, we would, we'd rather prevent it than try to deal with, with, with uh, curing it because it's not really curable. Yeah. So Linda is in our live audience and she wants to have a little bit better understanding of how the vaccine can help horses with a genetic predisposition such as uh, Appaloosa's. Um, Dr. Boggs, can you touch on that? Sure. So um, how, how the vaccine would, um, would work, it would be similar whether we're talking about Appaloosa's or, or warm bloods or thoroughbreds or quarter horses or any, any of those types of horses. Um, what the vaccine does is it, it prevents, um, when, when the horse is exposed to um, leptospires in the environment, if the horse has previously been vaccinated, the theory behind all vaccines is that you show the body um, a small amount of, um, you know, the bacteria or a small amount of virus that you're trying to get an immune response to. And then the body is able to respond by producing white blood cells and um, antibodies. And the goal of vaccination is to do that before exposure, hopefully, so that when uh, an animal is actually exposed to any kind of a disease that you've vaccinated for, the body can more quickly respond. Because it takes some leg time if it's the first time the body's seen this particular agent. So the goal would be you vaccinated your horse once, you've done a booster three to four weeks later, and then um, if you were to have a, a high exposure, say maybe your horse uh, was exposed to a broodmare that was aborting, and so there was a large volume of leptospires that, you know, maybe were, were expressed uh, in the fetus or in, in the urine, um, that, oh, that the immune system would respond quicker. Um, and then what it does is it prevents infection of the leptospires into the bloodstream, so it, it, it prevents that um, access there, and then it actually uh, um, blocks the transmission into the urine. And so basically from our safety and efficacy studies, we've been able to identify that the vaccine will prevent leptospires in the bloodstream and will we'll be able to block them getting into the kidney and then into the urine. So it also prevents urine shedding, which is important when we talk about, um, as we mentioned before, what are, what are the routes of exposure to other animals? We talk a lot about wildlife, but we also know that horses can also contaminate the environment and their urine can be a source of contamination. Dr. Boggs, we have a question from Kelly in Missouri, and Kelly is another one of our Appaloosa owners, and she wants to know if the vaccine is available everywhere in the U.S. She said that her vet hasn't mentioned it to her. It is. So the vaccine is a fairly new vaccine. It was launched in October of last year, and it is available uh, across the, in all of the United States. It's not available in Europe yet. Um, but all the United States, and uh, it's available through directly through Zoetis or through distri distribution. And so it may be something, um, it, it, Kelly, after listening to this, if, if you're concerned and you'd like to, to learn a little bit more, um, I would have a conversation with your veterinarian about this and, and say, you, you know, you listen to the, to the talk and um, you'd like to learn about the availability of the vaccine and, and have a conversation about whether, um, you know, that's an appropriate um, vaccine to add to your protocol. Uh, Dr. Carter, the next question is for you. It's from Nancy in Colorado. And Nancy says that it seems to her like most ha Appaloosas have some degree of uh, uveitis. I'm not sure if, if we have numbers on that. Um, but she wants to know if they can be born with the disease. Well, um, I've, I've seen data that, that say that up to 25% of the App Appaloosa population could have some, you know, variation of uh, uh, severity of of, of UV uveitis, and of course that's not all going to be lepto-associated uveitis. Uh, so again, as as Jackie pointed out, you know, they're eight times as as susceptible, so there's no you know, no question, that's been pretty well characterized. I think it's actually 8.3 times. Uh, but as far as being born born with it, there I, I know of no evidence that a healthy horse that's born is is infected with leptospirosis. But you got to 
realize that uh, you know the second they're out here out outside and and in the environment uh, that they're going to be have just the same probability of, of uh, being exposed as you know as any other animal in that in that environment so uh, if if the area that where their their fold is is a highly contaminated environment then there's a chance that a, a folk could pick it up you know quite quite early on so but as far as I know though they are not they are not born with it and dr. Carter our newborn foals are so fragile it seems like they can catch just about anything and um, and yeah. and get sick so is lepto something that a foal or a newborn would catch and you'd immediately see clinical signs or is it something that is going to plague them later on in life well, you know, it's interesting. It seems like you don't uh, that we don't see many many cases of of, of leptospirosis in folds, and I'm sure the colostral antibody has uh, has has a lot to do with that. Um, I think some of the cases that we miss sometimes are are maybe more the the five six six month old foals that end up with just a systemic uh, lep leptospirosis infection that uh, that might end up is is, uh, is a kidney infection and that kind of thing but it, but it is interesting that the you know the most predominant time that we diagnose it is not in the in the younger animals but in but in the adults we have a question from Sarah in our live audience, and Dr. Boggs, I'll give this to you, and, and Dr. Carter, maybe you'll want to jump in too. But Sarah's in New York, and she has a great Appaloosa mare who's at least 31 years old, and the horse has had chronic uveitis in both eyes. Um, she she doesn't know if lepto is the cause, but she wonders if it would be worth vaccinating the mare for a lepto just in case and possibly also vaccinating the rest of the herd that lives with the mare. Well, I'll start and Dr. Carter can chime in. Uh, first of all, congratulations that you have a 31-year-old horse. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I'm sorry to hear that you've, you've battled uveitis in, in both eyes and it's been a chronic thing because we know how, how heartbreaking that disease can be. Um, really, this would not be the place that I would recommend using the vaccine. The vaccine is labeled for the vaccination of healthy horses six months of age or older. And when we say healthy, that means, you know, free of what we believe to be leptospirosis, the disease of leptospirosis. So, uh, while we may we don't necessarily know that your uveitis was triggered by lepto, um, that your horse has already got an immune system that's over responding to a trigger inappropriately, as I mentioned before. And so, um, you know, and unfortunately, he's not a candidate for the vaccine. That wouldn't be where I would recommend it. However, um, if you have other horses on the same property, the biggest risk factor we know from, from the data um, and our seroprevalence data that both the, the, um, the folks in Kentucky as well as Goetis did some seroprevalence data, we know that the, one of the biggest risk factors for exposure is common environments. And so your horse, if it was let go, that, that triggered the uveitis, has been exposed to an environment that has lepto in it or had lepto in it at some point, and so your other horses may also be equally exposed. And whether that's wildlife, like we've discussed, or dogs or cattle, standing water, or a combination of things, um, you know, they're potentially at increased risk. And so your healthy horses that don't currently have signs of uveitis may be candidates for the vaccine, and that might be a very good thing to consider adding into your protocol. Dr. Carter, would you add anything to that? Well, yeah, you know, something else that, that we're doing here, and we actually have a research project right now, we're, we're trying to determine sort of the carrier state uh, in adult horses uh, here in Kentucky, and we're, we're Zoetis actually is funding this project, and we're looking at uh, uh, horses that are submitted for necropsy. These are horses that have expired, of course, uh, that to see uh, if we can find uh, lepto DNA anywhere in the, either in the eyes, uh, the eye vitreous fluid, uh, in the kidneys, or in the urine, 
And the the other thing, once we put our, our Lepto PCR online, uh, which is very, very sensitive uh, and not going to miss the DNA, uh, is we, we ask uh, our clients that if they suspect or want to, you know, really assess their group of horses, uh, if they can send us uh, urine, urine samples, that we, we can determine whether there's any horse in, in their group that is actually shedding into the environment. And uh, the final thing I'd say is we, we have done some serological assessments of some of uh, farms where there are two, three, four, five horses that have evidence of uveitis, and, and, and we have seen some you know pretty high you know lepto titers in those horses and and so like as Jackie said that if if you know if you if they are shedding uh, in the environment then you really do want to offer some protection of the you know the healthy horses that are that are still in that in that herd. Um, Dr. Carter, we've talked a lot about that Appaloosa so far in our hour. Um, is there any differentiation between the Appaloosas that have colored coats or the Appaloosa characteristics versus the solid horses that are of Appaloosa breeding but don't have the color characteristics? Are they divided out um, in the research? Uh, yeah, I, I have not, I'm not aware of that, no. I, I don't think, uh, Jackie, have you any knowledge of that? Um, my recollection is that the horses that have um, there is a little bit of difference. The horses that have um, m more color are at less risk, I think it is, of, okay. um, of potentially um, ERU. I think I recall that there's a little bit of difference between the coat pattern, yeah. Interesting. So our next question then for Dr. Carter is from Elizabeth in Florida, and she wants to know if we have any understanding of the reason why warm bloods and draft horses would be also more susceptible to lepto? Well, really, the, the best answer to that is really is, is this is a genetically related, genomically related predisposition. And uh, the, the uveitis, as Jackie's also mentioned, is, is, is a actually uh, kind of characterizes an autoimmune type response that where we have similarity in the antigens in the retina and other parts of the eye to the flagellar antigens in the bacteria that, that cause that immune reaction. But it, it just appears that there is a genetic uh, predilection uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in some of these breeds, the warm bloods, the drafts, and of course the Appaloosa. And uh, there's, you know, work more work going on. I mean, the the, the hottest button in, in in research right now is finding uh, markers for disease and genetic markers that that uh, can be tested for, that can at least alert, uh, you know, either an, an owner or uh, on a pre-purchase exam, you know, what what is the risk, you know, for different diseases. So this is a still a fairly uh, young, uh, young endeavor going on in science, but it's, it's certainly very promising. Dr. Boggs, we have a question from Linda in Alabama. So Linda had a horse, a gelding, that got lepto when he went to a boarding facility. She wants to know if a horse has a chance of getting it if it never leaves the farm. Well, uh, yes. Yeah. So your horse has a chance of getting lepto if it's in the in an environment in which lepto is being shed. So as we've been discussing throughout this conversation, um, you know, the wildlife don't know borders between one farm and the next. Um, and you know, even if your horse never leaves the property and doesn't go on the rodeo circuit or go on the horse show circuit. If you have wildlife coming through your property and that's the source of contamination, then your horse is at risk potentially. Um, or if you're grazing with cattle, or all the things that we've been discussing, you know, in this presentation so far. So, um, you know, it's not a, it's not really a traveling kind of disease per se. And the question is also if your horse went to a boarding operation and came home, 
we don't really know when in his time span he was exposed to lepto. Maybe he was exposed at, at the property of origin. Maybe he was exposed at the boat boarding operation. Maybe both. Um, so I, I would say that he, yes, he's potentially at risk even if he doesn't travel. Dr. Carter, Russen, Pennsylvania, wanted to know if there's any evidence that paint horses are more susceptible to plepto than than other breeds. Hey, hey, Russ in Pennsylvania. Yes, you well, you probably maybe kind of figured it out with this discussion. We've had uh, quite a bit of focus on on this area, and of course, uh, you know, we we mentioned that drafts and warm bloods are are there's uh, somewhere in the in the middle, you know, between the Appaloosas and the and the thoroughbreds and standard breeds, which are considered the lowest risk. Pain horses are are warm blood horse, so really that breed has what I call an intermediate risk for lipto induced uh, uveitis. Um, Dr. Boggs, Renee in Kentucky wants to know uh, about pregnant mares and how susceptible they are to losing their foals. What's the best method for preventing pregnancy loss? Well, I'm going to start this, but I'm certainly going to defer to Dr. Carter, who's uh, got much more experience in, the, in, in dealing with lepto and pregnant mares. But um, it, again, it's environmental risk factors. Um, you know, the pregnant mare has an additional potential risk factor because you know she has a uterus and she's and she's carrying a foal. So if she were to come in contact with the leptospires and it's a, you know a significant enough exposure and with her individual, um, you know sort of response to that exposure, she she may be at risk. You know, one of the best preventative um, measures, um, probably in this case vaccination, um, you know, now that we have a good vaccine that's on the market, it's been available for a year. Uh, just recently, the vaccine received an additional label claim for safe for use in all stages of pregnancy, so all three trimesters. And so um, certainly that's what I would consider the best prevention and then as well as all of the wildlife types of prevention that we've mentioned before. Um, but many of these mares are not put in stalls or, um, you know, they're, they're grazing out in pastures and they've got ponds and they've got a lovely life on the bluegrass and we know that some of these farms are endemic and it's not just Kentucky. We know that um, there are farms throughout the United States that can be endemic with um, lepto on the property and so put, um, potentially put those mares at risk. Dr. Carter, would you add anything to that? Yeah, well, the only thing I can add is I think I already sort of mentioned this again here in the bluegrass because we have such a high density of pregnant mares, over 20,000 a year, and we have we have a reasonably high rate of, of uh, lepto-associated abortion. Uh, the, the Many of the farms literally monitor the micro, microscopic agglutination titers for lepto uh, in all their pregnant mares. Some of them do it, you know, once a month, and watch those titers. And and although this is not published data, it's not in the scientific literature. These veterinarians here who've been doing this for decades uh, have have uh, you know developed this anecdotal. Um, protocol of, of, of looking at those titers and, and some of them do it, and there are a few variations in this, but the ones that I, the veterinarians I have spoken to and work with, generally when the titers reached about a 1 to 3200 or greater, they will put the mare on a 7 to 10 day course of, of either oxytetracycline or doxycycline uh, and, and then monitor the titers after that. Generally the titers just start dropping quite quickly and I, when I ask them, well, do you think this saves foals? And they, I'd say without a doubt, they say they think it saves at least half, and maybe more than more than half of the foals, that ha, you know, that have mares that are infected at this level. You no, know, one thing we might, Michelle, one thing we might want to do is um, we haven't talked much about the microscopic agglutination titer. Um, might that be something that would be worth? Kind of expanding on that diagnostic test in case our listeners aren't familiar with that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which which one of you guys want to tackle that topic? Dr. I'm going to let Dr. Carter, Dr. Carter have that one. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I, I felt it going that way. So 
<laughs> I think you got volunteered, well, yeah. Doctor Carter. You got you got me, Jackie. Well, <laughs> yeah, we. I, I would actually say, you know, of course, I'm director of the lab, and I'm really, really proud of my faculty and people and scientists and technicians here. But I think we have probably one of the very best serology labs in the world and and especially when it comes to running this microscopic agglutination titer uh, when we did our national study to try to assess if horses are being exposed only in Kentucky and Florida and New York or are they actually uh, being uh, uh, exposed to leptospires all over the country well that we, we when we run those ran those specimens we ran them all through our lab so we had a nice standardized uh, result and and we also have such high confidence but basically this is a test where the veterinarian uh, draws blood and we spin that down and get the serum which which pretty much leaves uh, you know the anti all the antibody in the in that serum and uh, in the lab they work with actually a live organism and of course there are several serovars of, of leptospirosis in in different species and of course Pomona is the one that we find in probably 95 plus percent of our abortion cases and I, I think that's generally the highest one found in the uveitis cases as well. The number two uh, serovar that we we see associated with, with these is Gripotyphosa. Uh, and then there's there's others that are commonly looked the commonly run for different species like Canicola Ectorohemorrhagia, uh, Harjo, and is all, often seen uh, in cattle. And then there's a sixth one called Bratislava, which is r really associated with this, the the swine. But we we're also that was the 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 um, servar that we saw the highest titers on in this national study, which was uh, kind of surprising. And I know that Zoetis is is I believe underway, maybe looking trying to learn a little more about. Bratislava and what that really means in the horse. Uh, in this study that we're doing uh, on the animals submitted for necropsy, we we have found one, we've had one positive uh, identification of so far on 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 vitreous fluid in the eye, and that was a Bratislava, which kind of uh, was interesting. So now that I just found that out today, so now I'm going to be digging hmm. in the literature to see if I can. See, you know, edge. learn more about that. <laughs> but and that's the one that they find in sea lions, and I haven't seen a sea lion around here any time recently. So, uh, anyway, it it uh, it is it is very interesting. But uh, basically, they work with the live organism in the lab, and and so we have live isolates of all these different serovar leptos, and uh, and they get an agglutination of the the serum with these organisms and when they see that then they know that that the antibody is against that particular serovar of lepto and and so, so uh, yeah correct me correct me if i'm wrong dr carter but um if we get a positive titer to one of our those serovars um it means the horse has been exposed to the organism correct. but it may or may not mean the horse actually has active infection correct Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's that's something that that is very very misunderstood. Uh, even even in the some of the veterinary uh, professional areas, because you know every every serological test has a different range of titers. You know, and 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 they're sometimes even displayed in different forms. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, it can be confusing. But, you know, we call here, we call a 1 to 200 titer, we call it positive, but we no one considers clinical disease, you know, at that level. But as I mentioned earlier, that once you start getting up to like 1 to 16, 1 to 3,200, uh, then, you, then your, your clinical suspicion starts, starts going up. Uh, a little bit, and it makes you kind of want to track that. And of course, if you have the fourfold rise in in your titers, but in within about a two-week period, um, that is likely that, along with especially along with the clinical signs, if we have a, a horse that isn't, you know, been off feed or getting rough or or whatever, uh, I would make, you know, I would say that's a very be high would raise leptospirosis very high on the differential list. So the 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 MAT titer, the microscopic glutination titer test, is really it's still considered the gold standard, uh, and is and is really a valuable tool 
for uh, for you know doing uh, diagnostics in in all species that that suffer from leptospirosis. So, Dr. Carter, one of the questions that we got during registration was from Michael in California, and and Michael wanted to know for the horses that do test positive uh, for for the uh, exposure, um, which horses should be vaccinated? Well, as, as Jackie said, healthy horses over six months of age. Um, you know, a titer, any of those low titers, and, and believe me, most of them fall into that low low range. You know, we've run thousands and thousands of these things. Uh, you know, if they're a healthy, if they're a healthy animal, then I'd say I vaccinate them. Okay. So, Dr. Boggs, our next question is from Shannon in New Jersey, and Shannon wants to know how effective the Lepto vaccine is. So the, the vaccine, um, safety and efficacy studies were done prior to launch, and what we do in safety and efficacy studies is we look at um, a group of horses that um, are vaccinated with the, with the vaccine and a group of horses that are called controls that don't get the vaccine, and then both groups are exposed to the leptospires, so um, are exposed over a course of several days. And uh, what we identified in those groups is that 100% of the horses that receive the vaccine were protected. And amazingly, 100% of the horses that did not receive the vaccine, we were able to isolate the organism back out. So that means we looked at getting it out of the bloodstream, getting it out of the urine, or out of the kidneys. And so that equates to 100% what we call preventable fraction. And so what, what we're, we're able to prevent is the actual infection of the leptospires into the bloodstream and into the kidneys. Um, it does not have a label for actually um, preventing these other diseases, these clinical entities that we've talked about, um, renal disease, abortion, um, or equine recurrent uveitis, because we don't have challenge models for those. Um, but you've got to get the leptospires in the bloodstream in order to create those diseases. And so when you ask how effective the vaccine is, I can say that it's got 100% um, you know, preventable fractions. We know in terms of how it's behaving in the marketplace, it's been out um, for almost a year now. Um, maybe, Dr. Carter, you could share with us the, the number of abortions that you've seen associated with lepto this spring, and I know that none of those mares had received the vaccine um, that were positive for lepto-associated abortions. Now, it doesn't mean the, tech, so let, the vaccine presented it, but it, it is nice. But wasn't it about 25 horses that you saw this year? Yeah, yeah, I think it was 24 or 25. I don't have that have that off the top of my head, but that's yeah. right where it was. And yes, we we are in the middle. I, I about two weeks ago, I sent out a, a survey to about 600 uh, farms here associated with the Kentucky Thoroughbred Farm Managers Club uh, to try to get a, a better handle on that. But of all the cases that we uh, that we had at the lab, and of course you have to understand the diagnostic laboratory only sees the iceberg of what is in the field. If they don't send it to us, obviously we can't, we don't know about it. We feel like because of the, you know, the value of the animals here and the close proximity to the laboratory, we feel like we probably have one of the highest submission rates on abortion maybe of anywhere in the whole world. Uh, but again, there, I'm sure there's some that occur that we're not aware of. But of the ones that we we followed back up on all the the uh, abortions that uh, that we received here at the lab, and we did we did not find you know any that uh, uh, any vaccine breaks, and that means you know where we had a vaccinated a, a horse that was properly vaccinated, a mare that uh, aborted. So you know we're we're pleased with that. We, of course, this is the first the first round, just the first season, and we're going to continue to do this survey probably in the next four or five years to to see, you know, what what kind of a long term uh, uh, performance we can see. But it's very, very, very encouraging data at this point. So we have a question from our live audience, uh, Dr. Martinez. Uh, practices in Kentucky and would like to know how you would recommend incorporating the vaccine into the protocol of a pregnant mare at what months of pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Bob, you want that? Sure. Um, 
So we, we know that the majority of the abortions associated with lepto are late-term abortions. Um, and so, you know, ideally you, you potentially want to have your, um, your, your first round of vaccines. If it's the first year, you're going to need to do one and then a booster uh, three to four weeks later. So you'd like to have that fully on board before you enter, I think, ideally, you know, into your third trimester. Many of the farms that started last year, they vaccinated their mares in second trimester. Um, so they had, the, you know, the highest uh, antibody titers going into that late-term phase. However, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the, um, we do have a full label claim, safe for use in all stages of pregnancy. So really it provides you with some flexibility depending on the protocol of your farm. You can place it at first, second, or third trimester. Um, and many of those people will be doing it in conjunction with one of their um, rhino vaccines. So one of their, you know, maybe five, seven, or nine months of pregnancy when you're doing your rhino vaccine. So um, many people are doing that. So you've got a lot of flexibility, um, but many of the farms I know are, are, are vaccinating in, in the second or third trimester. We have another question from our live audience. Kathy would like to know if the vaccine only prevents abortion or does it also prevent uveitis? And right. Dr. So, Dr. Box, you can take that. So the vaccine has a label for the prevention of leptospiremia and leptospiuria. So those are really big words that mean prevention of um, the organism being able to get into the bloodstream and being able to have access to the urine. So we're not able to recover, as I mentioned earlier, um, in those challenge cases in our safety, um, I mean, excuse me, in our efficacy work. Uh, we were not able to recover the leptospires out of either the blood, urine, or the kidney. Um, so it doesn't actually have a label that says it will prevent abortion or prevent um, uveitis because that requires um, a challenge model for those types of diseases. And especially with uveitis, it's a multifactorial disease for which we don't have a good challenge model. So basically, um, it's preventing the, if you're exposed to the, to the leptospires, ideally the animal would be then um, prevented from having leptospires get access to the bloodstream. And as we mentioned before, you have to have access to the bloodstream um, and then travel to these sites um, that the, the organism seems to have a tropism for certain sites in the horse, the kidneys or the, uh, the reproductive tract or the eyes. Um, and so that's what, what the label says. Uh, Dr. Carter, we have a question from Janice in Virginia, and Janice has a 21-year-old Appaloosa gelding that lost an eye three years ago due to complications from uveitis. She wants to know if it's safe to vaccinate him. So we've talked a lot about it. we vaccinate healthy horses. What about a horse that has lost its eye already to uveitis? Is that horse considered a healthy horse at that point? Well, I would say no. I, you know, basically, as Jack, Jackie has said, I think a couple times already, you know, the safety and efficacy of vaccinating horses with a previous history of uveitis has, has not been evaluated and assessed. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just one of those things that that probably needs to be needs to be looked into and maybe needs to to be. Uh, try to to uh, you know ascertain if if that's something that uh, makes makes good scientific sense, but it it doesn't exist now as far as I know. Jackie, chime in. I would agree with like, you. No, yeah. we uh, we we'd love to learn more about um, you know the use of vaccination in the face of of uveitis cases, but that I would not recommend vaccinating that horse. And who knows, the horse might have gotten uveitis from something other than uh, lepto, um, but he, to me, wouldn't be considered a, quote, healthy horse. And that at this point, we don't have enough scientific data to support that recommendation, and we certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, recommend something that we don't, we don't know how it would respond. Dr. Carter, we have a question from Christy in Tennessee, who has a five-month pregnant mare, uh, and this mare just uh, tested with high titers uh, for lepto. She wants to know if that horse is safe to vac vaccinate or if she should be vaccinated because she does have those higher titers. Yeah. 
Well, it's kind of the same, same channel here. You know, the efficacy trials were performed on, on uh, six-month or older, older horses, and, and so really I wouldn't recommend vaccinating a bred, you know, bred mare at that age uh, and, you know, until we have more experience with the vaccine and, and more research. Um, we've already talked about how we assess the titers uh, and and how prophylactic treatment can be uh, done against so that's uh, you know not not anything that's been you know well characterized in the scientific literature but it's it's certainly uh, you know a, a major option in in a lot of situations in the veterinary practicing community and so uh, that would be you know that would be something to to think about but I think. Probably maybe following. I would get if that's just one titer, and I don't know what what you mean, Chris. Chris, about a high titer. Uh, feel free to call me if you'd like. You know, like to talk more about this. Uh, but you know, maybe getting another titer, uh, for, you know, a month down the line, and see if that titer is staying there or maybe receding, and then it might just have been an exposure, and you don't have anything to worry about. And then, what, of course, what you can do once the the mare is uh, uh, a little older, then of course you know the vaccine is is fine for all trimesters. So uh, you, you know then you could go ahead and vaccinate at that point, assuming well, you, you think, feel the horse is not as sick as it's a healthy animal. Is it a five month old horse or is she five months pregnant? She's five months pregnant, I believe. Oh, okay, yeah, because I was yeah, kind of thinking, yeah, that's a little bit pregnant. strange there. Well, and then in that case, I said a lot for, <laughs> said a lot for nothing. Because Jackie, you've already answered that one. Yes, you can vaccinate. You can vaccinate, but can vaccinate. as long as you think it's a it's a, a healthy animal, if that titer is yeah. under one to sixteen hundred, you know, I would say it'd be fine. Um, yeah. So. So our hour of lepto went by really fast, um, and and we've finished out the hour. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to ask each of you um, to share what the one thing you hope our audience takes away from tonight's conversation is. Uh, let's start with uh, with you, Dr. Boggs. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> well, in um, lepto in a nutshell. Lepto in a nutshell. Well, I think the biggest thing is that lepto has been under-recognized in the horse. And we know from the serologic data from both the University of Kentucky and some data that um, Zoe did several years ago that 75% of the horses, um, well, if you look at the cutoff that Zoe has used, 75% of the horses across the country are exposed. It doesn't mean they have clinical disease, but they're exposed. And so, um, and we know that there's not a lot of difference between the East and the West. And it, our, our data very much mirrored the data from the University of Kentucky. We just used a little bit of a different cutoff titer. And uh, I think that was eye-opening for, for us on the ends of doing these studies, as well as the fact that it's something, it's under-recognized. We need to put it on our radar. We need to think about the risk factors and recognize we've talked a lot about Appaloosas today, but they are certainly not the only um, breed that's at risk. Um, certainly any horse is at risk uh, if they have enough ex of these exposure factors to potentially, um, you know, come down with leptospirosis, which can be quite devastating. And so prevention is tough, um, and there is a vaccine out now that I'm, I'm proud to be able to say I was involved in, and I feel very confident in its safety and its efficacy, and it would be something I'd encourage horse owners to talk to their veterinarians about. And Dr. Carter? Well, yes, I, I just want to thank thank uh, Zoetis for sponsoring this and for your for horse putting this on, and and uh, really really appreciated such a tremendous response for, uh, from the audience. Uh, I, I really salute Zoetis for for uh, tackling this and 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 making the commitment to making the vaccine. Uh, you know. A, Looked at 20 years worth of data here in in Kentucky, and just doing the economic projections, it looked like they had over 100 million dollar losses in foals in that in that 20 years, and that's just right here in just this little bluegrass part of uh, part of the U.S. So again, I salute Zoetis for the just extremely professional and scientific approach to the to the way they uh, they and, and Jackie and her team. Uh, did made this vaccine, and and uh, we're all just 
you know, really excited uh, for the horse and the horse community. And, and if I never see another uh, another horse uh, uh, abort from Letho, or especially get uveitis uh, from Letho, I'll be I'll be I will retire happy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also want to thank Zoetis for sponsoring tonight's event and bringing it to our audience for free. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, so I want to uh, make sure to thank you, uh, Dr. Carter and Dr. Boggs, as well, well, for joining us and sharing all this great information. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Well, thank Thanks you for, for having us. And finally, I want to thank everyone who submitted questions during registration, asked questions during the live event, and, and listened for the, for the last hour. Uh, I hope you can join us next month when we are talking about managing mature equine athletes. Until then, from all of us at The Horse, uh, we hope you have a great night.